welcome to the video guide for the 2021 edition of My Sheep Hear My Voice by Joseph Hedgecock. The idea is that you read a chapter within a week and then you watch this video within a small group uh, to encourage each other, spur each other on, um, challenge each other and maybe share testimony even. But you also watch this video and uh, to highlight some areas and to listen to some key points uh, that you need to maybe pay attention to or uh, to focus on. Our God's a good God and he's got an exciting journey ahead for all his children, especially those children that choose to bow the knee and to walk with him, choose to walk in relationship with him. So we're going to go over those things, we're going to look at those things and we're going to set foundations in place, or uh, that's the intention at least anyway. Now I'm not going to read every part of the chapter, I'm not going to reiterate um, every detail in the chapter. You've got that book, it's like a pearl of great price. For those that really love Jesus. So if you really want to walk with him, you'll read that book, you'll pull things out, you'll have the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you in those things. And we'll talk about that more as we go through the book. But you need to at some point make a decision that Jesus is worthy of everything. And that's what we'll focus on today as we go over what is called the introduction in the book. If you see any points in the book that are bold, those areas are key points that the author, Joseph C. Hedgecock, highlighted or wanted to focus on. Key points that you're basically not to miss. Key points that are crucial to, to try and understand by the Spirit. So if you've read the introduction, we'll move on and we'll look at that. And I want to start today talking about what fellowship with God means, what fellowship actually is. And we're going to look at what fellowship set is in the Strong's Concordance. In its Strong's 2842 Greek, it's literally participation or social intercourse benefaction, communicate or communication, communion, a fellowship. And it's linked to Strong's 2844, which means to be a companion, associate or partaker. Well, isn't that amazing that we could be partakers of a relationship with the living God, that we could be companions of his, that we could actually fellowship with him? If you've read the book you read this week about the Garden of Eden and what Adam and Eve enjoyed in that garden with God and what this is describing for his children, that we could have fellowship with him, what it's describing is that heaven on earth kind of concept. Now, we're not going to experience the fullness of that on this planet, but we are at least going to experience some of it, including walking in fellowship with God, because we realise after reading the introduction that that's what we were created for. So let's start with a very important point that was in bold in the introduction, and that is that God never wants you to be separated from his presence. Now, that's an important point to consider, to remember, to focus on, to have around the belt of truth. It's something to keep, that God never wants you to be separated from his presence. It's crucial that you remember that. You see, many Christians, they find themselves maybe distant from God because we read in that, so this scripture that it's sin that separates you from God or iniquities separate you from God. We read that in the introduction. So we know that sin separates, but our God is a good God and Jesus is an amazing saviour. I want you to remember that God never wants you to be separated from his presence. He wants you close. He wants you personal. He loves you so much. A lot of Christians act like you know God's chief purpose is to keep them away from him. That as if that's what God's motivation is. And sometimes when we hear about sin and talk about sin and talk about iniquity and issues and things that people do, it can appear like God has got a lot of rules. God doesn't have a lot of rules. He just wants you to walk in obedience to him through hearing his voice. So remember, God never wants you to be separated from his presence. Never forget that. He loves you. Amen? Now the only one that would tell you that God wants you to be separated uh, from him would be the devil. And we know the devil's a liar. We've read in the introduction that Eve was seduced or tricked by the enemy who questioned what God said. Another key point for us to remember is never, never doubt what God says and never allow a voice to come in that will go against what God said and teach you, you know, something that is contrary to what God is saying. The devil is a liar. You know, that's a good thing as well. The fact that the devil's a liar, I don't mean it's good to lie, so don't get me wrong. But what I mean is if the devil's a liar and the devil, for example, says that God doesn't want you in his presence, 
then we know the devil's a liar, he can't tell the truth. So the truth is God does want you in his presence. When we consider the devil and his lies and his trickery, consider areas of your life where maybe you knew something was going to be wrong, you knew something shouldn't, have, you know, shouldn't work out or you shouldn't do something a certain way. Consider areas of your life and see if there's any areas where you know what God has said, but maybe you've been deceived and, and now you're starting to question, did God really say that? As I've been through this book, My Sheep, Hear My Voice, with other people, they go through it and they get excited and they're, they're spurred on. And then before you know it, they meet other people, maybe in their church, because they're the only one or two uh, people maybe in, in the church. And one of other people around them tell, oh, you don't need to do that. Oh, you don't need to hear God. You don't need to seek a relationship with him. God's not interested in that. Jesus doesn't have to be Lord. They tell them all sorts of things. Where is that voice coming from? Now, I'm not saying the people are the devil. But what I'm saying is then the devil starts to question, is this right? Is that what we're supposed to be doing? The good thing is that we have been given scriptures and there's over 150 scriptures in this book that would just emphasize and highlight and show you that we have a scriptural backing to walk with God. So never listen to a voice that questions what God has actually said. God knows what's best. He loves you. And another thing, you need to believe that. You need to know that God really loves you, that when God tells you not to do something, don't touch this or don't touch that, it's because of his love. Amen. So one of the questions that you could ask yourself in this group or ask each other in your group, maybe write it down now. Is there a time that you ever went against what God said? We know Eve and Adam went against what God said. We know they did what they did. And it's, you know, I've heard some believers say, it's all Eve's fault. We blame her. But we too are all have been like sheep that have gone astray. We too have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It, we would probably have done the same thing because we have that nature or because we're susceptible to deception without God, without being close and without staying close and recognizing the gift that we've been given to walk with him. So consider it. Is there any time in your life when you went against the will of God. When you knew God told you to do something, but you decided to go against it anyway. What were the consequences? Consider those consequences. I mean, Eve's consequences and Adam's consequences, down the line, you know, it's what we call the fall of man. And, and many there were, there were major consequences to that. But I just want you to consider that personally. And the reason for that is so that you take ownership, that you don't blame others for what's gone wrong or you don't blame others for areas in your life, that you recognize God really does love you. You know that God wants the best for you. And you also recognize that you are a problem too. And if you start with that background, God sees that humility, sees that you recognize errors and recognize your need in him. And then he really, Jesus, is a wonderful saviour. Another point is that we need to remember that that tree in the garden was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We were never meant to be like gods. We were never meant to work out what's right, wrong, good or evil, as if we have our own good moral compass. Because as many people now that have very different moral compasses, they're very different views on things all sorts of violence and riots and arguments and bitterness and, and so many ranging views. How could all be right? The only one who's ever right is God. So remember that too, that it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil that, that Eve was told not to eat from. And we too have that same command in a sense that we are not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, we're not to decide what's evil, what's good, we just want to follow Jesus, to follow him. He's the only one who really knows because he is God. Maybe you could think of an area where you did something good because it looked good, it looked right, it seemed right. Maybe others told you it was right. Maybe you could consider something that was good. I mean, evil things are obvious. It's the good things that sometimes are difficult for Christians to spot or believers to spot. Maybe you did something good and it didn't quite work out how you expected. Maybe because it wasn't the good that comes from God, it was the good that comes from your own understanding, your own nature. Maybe in group you could share some things about that, discuss that. Discuss sometimes when you did something good, but it wasn't God. When we consider good things and what's good and what seems to be good, 
Some Christians believe that your life should be continuously blessed in how it appears, continuously good. Only God knows what's good, and he can make goodness come out of all sorts of situations. On page 5 of the 2021 edition, Joseph Hedgecock talks about having more fun with God when things are going wrong than when things are going right. Have you ever experienced that? What's your experience when things go wrong? Can you have that intimacy with God that brings joy? Have you got some examples of that to share with others? Have you got some examples when you didn't have joy, when things were going bad and they got worse because of your attitude? Just encourage one another in those things and give examples of times when you've done that, when you've experienced that. If you haven't experienced that when things go wrong, if you haven't experienced that goodness, because that should be our testimony. Our Christian groups, our house groups, our, uh, our fellowship shouldn't, with each other should not be around complaining and saying how bad life is and how bad this was. It's all about how good God is. It's all about him. It should be that, yes, the situation was tough, but God got me through, but Jesus did this, but I felt his love, I felt his peace, I felt his joy. I had intimacy with him. I could hear his voice. Consider that, if indeed you can hear his voice. If you can't, by the time you've read we've been through this book, you will be able to. So consider that. Consider what it means to really walk with Jesus. And if we want to give him glory, we allow him to work through us, to keep close to us. And we give him the praise when in difficult situations, we can have more fun with him than some people can when things are going right. Now you don't have to just discuss the things that I'm talking about. They're key points and there are areas that, you know, other areas that God wants to look at. So your groups are free, but these are just to focus your attention on some things. But what is important, very important, is that you recognize that you, without Jesus, are lost. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. It tells us that we could have been objects or subjects of God's wrath. We've got scriptures that remind us that when Jesus comes back, he's going to have uh, the reward of everyone with him. We've heard of Matthew 7, 22 and 23, where people are saying, Lord, Lord, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. These are realities. And the thing about God is that you can't just love him from your own understanding. You can't muster up enough love just to love God. You can't try your hardest to work your way to God. His gift was free. It's by grace through faith. So if you don't know Jesus, today would be the day that you turn your heart to him and say, Jesus, I want to know you. You have to recognize that if you don't make that decision, or indeed if you've been a Christian for a long time, but haven't made the most of the opportunity that God has given you to walk with him and to grow, then really you're in a dangerous position, maybe an object of God's wrath. Hell is real, punishment is real, God, the judge, is real. And I do believe Jesus is coming back very soon. And he's coming back for a bride without spot, wrinkle, and blemish. When we consider those things, and if we recognize who God is, and surrender to Jesus, his love will pour in. His love will pour in. And the love that pours in is the love that we're going to invest back into God. We can't do it ourselves. We really need Jesus. Praying that someone would get fired up for Jesus or praying that uh, you would just start to, to love Jesus more or praying that you would hear God's voice. All those things, they may work to a degree, but it's really God all the while at work in us that makes the difference. So wherever you're at, whatever you've been going through, whether you've wasted time or not, whether you're a seasoned saint or a new Christian, it's time now to surrender to Jesus once and for all. And we're going to go on this journey together. We're going to move forward and we're going to grow in him. So in your groups, bow your heads. Don't look around to see each other. And just from the bottom of your heart, pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, I confess all of my sins to you now. I am a sinner. 
I ask Jesus that I can receive what you did for me on the cross. And I ask you to forgive me for being Lord, being master, instead of submitting to you, Jesus, because you truly are the Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would come into my heart, that you'd cleanse me of all unrighteousness, that you would take over, that you'd lead me this, from this day forward into the things that you have planned. And now, Jesus, I submit to you as my Saviour and my Lord. Now, in that moment, if you said it from the bottom of your heart, you should, sen you should be able to sense and feel God's love moving. You should be able to sense and feel his presence. If you didn't and you haven't, then you pray again. You seek him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Think of the prodigal. The prodigal came home and the father was running out. Keep seeking him. But at some point you've got to recognize and know and sense in your spirit that Jesus is coming in to take over. In Ezekiel 36 and verse 26, he says, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now think about that. It's not talking about flesh as in walking in the flesh. It's talking about a heart that is soft and a heart that is... Um, open towards God, a heart that is not hard towards God. So it's possible, based on this scripture, and again it's in Hebrews, that it's possible in this scripture that God can cause that to happen to, to you. He can cause you to have a, a heart of flesh, a heart that's sensitive to him. If, he's, if it's possible and you would release your faith into him, he can change your heart. Even if you don't feel like you're passionate about him, even if you don't feel like you're, you're serious about him, look at this scripture and ask God to change your heart and release your faith and believe it, that he can do this by himself. You don't have to muster up the love. You don't have to start the fire. He can start it in you. Again, verse 26, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. He is a good God. He's always to be our Lord and he's always to be our master. He's always to be our first love and the only real motive for seeking God has got to be love. God's love in and for us. So, enjoy your group this week. Consider the things that I've shared. Remember that Jesus is the Lord. And don't let that overwhelm you, because then you can start panicking. The devil can get in and say, give up now. It's, it's impossible. Nothing is impossible for God. He knows our human state. He knows we're human beings. But he also loves us. The truths in this book are far-reaching. There's many things to apply over time. But if you will yield and make a decision this week that you are going to start to apply these things bit by bit as the Holy Spirit reveals them, then you'll be blessed. Maybe look around the group. Maybe talk to one another. Maybe confess and say, I am going for this. I am going for Jesus. And you could hold each other accountable as loving brothers and sisters to say, how are you doing in this? How are you doing with what we looked at last week? How are you doing with that area that you talked about? You could be really brothers and sisters in Christ, spurring each other on to walk in a love relationship with Jesus because when he comes back, it really is all that's going to matter. Amen. Join me next week after you've read chapter 1.